All right, Payman, thank you so much for the uh, introduction and the invitation. It's it's nice to be here virtually, even though I'm also kind of here in person. Um, so, so uh, and also just before I begin, please interrupt me and ask any questions you have. Like I, I would, I'm hoping the talk is kind of down to earth and accessible. So if if I'm if you don't understand something, you should tell me, and I'll I'll try to clear it up. Uh, all right. So so my goal today is to tell you about some kind of elementary uh, problem in linear algebra. Actually, that's that's come up in a number of recent conjectures and how you can say something about it using input from uh, Hodge theory and, and arithmetic. Um, and uh, everything I'm going to say today is is joint uh, with Aaron Landsman. Um, and if you'd like to uh, look at the paper, it's it's canonical representations of surface group, which surface groups on the archive. Um, we posted it in May 22, 2022. And it, it, at the very end, I might mention some new results that are not not yet posted, but but we'll see if we have time. All right, so I want to start with some kind of very standard uh, geometric situation. Uh, so you have a map, uh, let's say a smooth projective map from X to S, where these are the al algebraic varieties. If you'd like, if you're if you're really uh, if you're really arithmetically minded, you can take S to be a point. Even then, that, that's already interesting. But but let's just say for now these are varieties of the complex numbers. Uh, and in that setting, if you have varieties of the complex numbers in a smooth proper map like this, maybe let me indicate that it's smooth and proper, so topologically trivial, there's kind of a linearization of, the, of this data. So there's a, a topological invariant, which is a, a representation of the fundamental group of S on the cohomology of X. Um, so loosely speaking, you, you take a, a cycle upstairs, you drag it in a circle, and then it, it goes to maybe a new cycle. And that's that's what this measures. Uh, there's an arithmetic analog of this. So if, if S is spec K, for, for K, uh, a, let's say a number field, then you get a you get a, a representation of the absolute Galois group of K on the elatic cohomology of X. Okay, and in both of these cases, there's some kind of general heuristic, which is that the image of this representation should be as big as possible. Um, so, so I'll give some examples of this, but but maybe for the number theorists in the audience, probably all of you have seen some version of this when. When X is an elliptic curve over a number field, and then and then or even let's say over Q, so over Q, like Sayer's open image theorem uh, tells us, well, uh, even if we put the Adels here, uh, this has kind of open image uh, for non-CM elliptic curves. Um, in this elliptic setting, there's a theorem of Bogomolov that says that that this has this has uh, open image uh, for non-CM elliptic non-CM elliptic curves, or even abelian sort of generic abelian varieties. Um, so that's what I mean by big in that setting. So, for example, what is it? What is it? it as big as possible means as big as as meets all the constraints there are. So, like if you have a CM elliptic curve, there's some extra constraints, so the monodromy is smaller. But if not, there's no constraints, and then you have big image. And I'll give some I'll give some kind of geometric versions of this in a second. Okay. So so here's kind of I think the most basic example for algebraic geometers. So you take MG is the moduli space of curves, and I'll tell you all about that in the next few slides. And well, it's a moduli space, so it has a universal curve over it. So in other words, a point of this, well, a point of this is a curve. It's a this is a parameter space of curves, and the fiber of that point is that curve. Okay. Well, in this setting, we have kind of a famous representation. So pi one of this moduli space acts on the cohomology of uh, of the of the curve. Um, are there any questions about what this representation is? Okay, so let me say what I mean when it has big that it has big image. Well, well, in this case, it's really a very explicit thing. So there's two structures on this group that have to be preserved by the action. So one is that it, well, inside of HCQ is HCZ. So there's the integral cohomology. So that has to be preserved by the action. And then there's another structure which comes from Poincare duality, like the cut product. There's an alternating form on this coming from the cut product. Okay, and and what that tells us, oops. Uh, Sorry, well, I skipped a slide. What tells us what that tells us is well, this action factors through the integer matrices, and it preserves the cup product. So it preserves a symplectic form, and then it's a, a not totally trivial theorem, but but at this point extremely well known that this factorization through sp two g of z, the integral matrices preserving a form, is actually surjective. So so uh, well, what does it mean? It means the image of the monotremy representation, the image of this representation, is as big as it could possibly be subject to the two constraints we listed. OK. Uh, we're going to slightly generalize the setting. So, so 
I'm going to allow points on my curve. So I'm going to work with MGN, the multiply space of genus G curves with N marked points. And this is going to be the universal puncture curve. So I'll take those curves and I'll delete the punctures. And again, we have a, a representation like this. So pi one of the, of the moduli space, and I'll make this more explicit soon, acts on the cohomology of this fiber. Okay, so what I want to study is a non-abelian version of this. Okay, and, and what is it? Well, pi one of the, the moduli space doesn't act just on just on the on the uh, cohomology, it actually acts on the whole fundamental group by outer automorphisms. And well, why is this like you can take a loop upstairs and drag it around in a circle and you get a new loop? And I'm just gonna not mod out by by con by by homology, by, by two loops being homologous to each other. I'll actually just mod out by them being homotopy equivalent to each other. Uh, so that doesn't give an honest action by automorphisms because two homotopy equivalent loops, like 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 homotopy. Like, like pi one is about based homotopy, not honest homotopy. But but the difference between based homotopy and, and honest homotopy is the inner automorphism, so, so the elements of pi one itself. So you get a, a representation like this of the mapping class group into the outer automorphism group. And by the way, it, like this is actually a really explicit thing, and I'll talk about it in a bit. But like if n is zero, this is almost an isomorphism. So this is fine. This is this thing has index two here if n is zero. Um, so so I'll and and it's injected. If n is positive, you can explicitly describe the image. Um, okay, so so I want to understand what it means for this to have big image. I just told you we can describe it, but that doesn't mean it's so easy. So let me let me. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm skipping a lot of slides here. Okay, so let me say what this group is that we're interested in. Uh, uh, so Daniel, n just remind me, n is the number of punctures, right? N is the number of punctures. G is the genus of the curve. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm gonna call this this group mod G N, and it has kind of an explicit description. Um, so so if I in terms of topology, so so if you set sigma G N to be our surface, so this has uh, this has uh, G uh, holes, so it's a G hole torus with N punctures. So, so this group, the fundamental group of the moduli space of genus G curves with n mark points, has a really explicit topological description. So you take the orienting orient, uh, orientation preserving homeomorphisms of this space, and so here I'm thinking of the punctures as mark points. So these homeomorphisms have to send the punctures to themselves. Um, well, well, that's a, this is a topological group with the compact open topology, and you take pi zero of that. Okay, so this is some very explicit thing. You can write down generators and relations for it if you want. Like if you ask your local topologist, I'll give an example when, when G is zero soon. Uh, and we'd like to understand uh, this action. So, so the action of this group or the outer action on the fundamental group of our curve. It's a purely topological question or even purely group theoretic. Like you can write down generators and relations for this group. You've, you've all seen them. There's like two, two G plus N generators in one relation and generators and relations for this group, they're a little more complicated. And you can say exactly how they act. OK, so what's the invariant we're going to be looking at? Well, if we act on a group, we act on representations of that group. So here, this is the set of representations, pi 1. And if we have an outer action on the group, then we act on representations up to conjugacy. OK, so, so here, this is representations up to conjugacy. Why do we act? Well. Uh, an inner automorphism, an element of pi one, sends a representation to a conjugate representation. So an outer representation acts on conjugacy classes of representations. Oops. Okay, and the, the question I'd like to ask is, does this action have big image? And, and we'll formulate this more precisely soon. Um, and I'll explain kind of how this has come up recently in a number of conjectures. Um, but let me just say that that this, this question has been studied in, in various incarnations by a lot of people. Uh, so, so notably, Goldman, Pickrell, and Shaw have studied things like. Um, so here they've studied things like ergodicity of the action. Maybe if you replace GLR with the unitary group, um, they, they've studied kind of density of orbits. Okay, and this is far from a complete summary of, of the work that's been done on this question from kind of a topological point of view. Um, from an algebra geometric point of view, a lot of work has been done by by Katsurkov, Pantov, and Simpson. So, I, but I, I won't say anything about that. Um, okay. So, be before we start studying this action, like let me uh, show you some examples, just just to show you that it's like a really explicit thing. Uh, so, the first simple example is 
Well, let's set n to be zero. So we're looking at a genus G curve with no mark points, so no punctures, a compact curve, and R is one. Uh, so, so in other words, we're looking at, at the action of this group on one-dimensional representations of pi one. Okay, well, what are one-dimensional representations of pi one? They're just C star to the 2G. But any one-dimensional representation factors through homology, which is Z to the 2G. And so if you'd like, you can think of this space as, as H1 of the surface with, with C star coefficients. Okay, and here we've actually already seen this action. So, so this action factors through the action on homology. It's just the action of SP2G on this, on this, uh, on this set. Okay. Here's kind of a more interesting example. I'm going to take G to be zero, R arbitrary, and N big, maybe. Okay. So, so what are the representations of this group? Well, this group you can think of. So here we have a sphere minus a bunch of points. Pi one is given by loops around those points. And what property do they have? Well, the product of those loops has to be one, right? Because if you kind of go around all these loops, you can contract the com composition by wrapping it around the back of the sphere. Okay, so, so this is the set we're acting on. And I can tell you explicitly how some generators of this group act. So, so they act by, by this funny formula. So let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, so if I have an n-tuple of matrices which multiply to one, what I'm allowed to do is switch two of them. So I, here I switch to QI and QI plus one, but I, at the cost of conjugating the second one by, 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 by the, the first one by the second one. Okay, and if you just stare at this formula for a minute, you'll see that this preserves the property that the product of the matrices is one. Um, so this gives you an action of, of, the, of the braid group on the set of matrices. And, and the braid group is, is the fundamental group of this model, I suppose. Um, so, so that's a fun little exercise. If you stare at the presentation for the braid group, you can see that, that these operations satisfy that presentation. Okay. So, so, uh, so let's go back to our very simple example, though, and, and make some make some uh, uh, make make some observations about it, and then then I'll tell you the kind of conjectures that those observations inspired and and where they come from. Okay. So there's two observations that are both kind of obvious about this action. So here we had the, we, this is the N is zero case, R is one case, the, the simplest possible case. It's just basically the same as the action on cohomology, the thing we started with. Um, okay, so the first observation is that all the finite orbits are torsion points. Um, so so uh, this is a little exercise. So what do we mean by torsion? So, so an element of this is like a 2G tuple of non-zero complex numbers. Torsion, I just mean those numbers are all roots of unity. Okay, and it's a little exercise to stare at the sp2g action on this thing and check that the only finite orbits are, are just the, the 2g tuples of, of roots of unity. Okay, so the finite orbits are exactly the torsion points. Uh, the second observation is that, well, those torsion points are just risky dense. Okay, so, so in, in other words, any polynomial equa equation which vanishes on, on all roots of unity is, is, is actually the zero polynomial. Okay. Okay, so so this these two observations I think motivated two conjectures. You mean, uh, you mean non finite orbits? No, 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 finite orbits. The fi all, all the finite orbits union together are the risky. Ah, the union of the finite. Yeah, yeah. Orbits. Maybe let me let me write that. So the union of the finite orbits is the risky dense. I thought yeah. you said that the same. Okay. So. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um. All right. Okay. So so these are both. I mean, the second thing is is kind of uh. You know, uh, uh, sort of probably you've seen it before. The first thing is is a little exercise with the group theory of SP2G. It's not not totally true. Okay, so so uh, it was conjectured by by two groups of number theorists that both of these properties generalize. So so let me tell you those conjectures and and where they come from. Okay, so so here's the action we're studying. So we've the pi one of the moduli space or or the symmetries of a genus G surface with n mark points acting on the set of representations up to conjugacy. Okay, so the first conjecture was made by Kissin and Wang. And the conjecture is that if G is large compared to the rank of the representation, the finite orbits are exactly the representations with the finite image. So that's the, the analog of all the all the finite orbits being torsion points. Um, so, so maybe let me say a word about their about the history here. So I think Kissin conjectured this around 2010. Um, and he he conjectured it without this condition, without the GBIG condition. And it's false without that condition. So that that was discovered. I mean, it, it's not so hard to see, but but it was discovered a couple of years later. Um, and then Wang corrected it. So Wang added this condition. So so where did these conjectures come from? So so 
Kissin, uh, both of both Kissin and Wenger are number theorists. Um, so Kissin was motivated by some potential applications to P, the P curvature conjecture, uh, which is a, a conjecture of, of growth and Deacon cats about the arithmetic of differential equations. And actually, that's how I came to this subject too. Um, Wang, uh, Wang is a student of Sarnak, who, or was a student of Sarnak, I guess, uh, who was motivated by Borgin, Gambert, and Sarnak's work on strong approximation for character varieties. Um, so, so uh, these these sets have some some underlying algebraic structure. They're actually defined over Z. Um, they're, they're algebraic varieties over Z, if you'd like, if you if you feel, formulate things appropriately. And in the case when G is zero, N is four, and R is two. Uh, Borgain, Gambert, and Sarnak proved that they satisfy some form of strong approximation. And, and so Wang was trying to, to generalize, or I, I think is still attempting to generalize that, that statement beyond that very special case, the, the G is zero and is four, uh, R, is, R is two case. Um, and and I, the sort of the first step in, in Borgain, Gambert, and Sarnak's work is to understand something about the finite orbits in that case. Um, so so this is, would be sort of the first step. In uh, in understanding the the kind of cases where the invariants are larger, so maybe let me write. So Wang was motivated by strong approximation for character varieties. And maybe let, let me just remark that there's been a lot of really excellent work done on this uh, latter topic by Will Chen recently. So so uh, if you uh, came to the algebraic geometry seminar, maybe you saw his his talk last semester. Um, but but will prove some really remarkable results also when when G is zero and is four and R is two. Okay, so so this generalizes the um, the uh, observation we made before that all finite orbits were were torsion points. So what about Zariski density? Uh, oh yeah, let me just say before I go on. So this condition is necessary. I'll give some examples later in the talk where if, if G is small compared to the rank, there are lots of finite orbits with infinite image. Um, but I want to say this is kind of a naive formulation. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it's like the, the simplest possible formulation of what it would mean for this action to have a big image. It says there's not many finite orbits, right? So, so if, the, if the action was very small, you would expect a lot of finite orbits. Um, okay, so, so this is the finite orbits are exactly the things that are forced to have finite orbit. I mean, anything with finite image, you can't really move around very much. It's, it's forced to have that same image no matter how you move it. Okay, uh, so, so what about... Um, what about this is risky density? Uh, so, so what I'm writing down here is a consequence of a conjecture of Aino and Kurtz and Buter Wang. So, so both groups conjectured this separately uh, or conjectured something that implies this separately. I'll say a little bit about what they conjectured, but whatever, whatever they conjectured, it implies, uh, uh, sorry, this, this, the condition, there's no, this condition isn't here. Sorry. Uh, the conjecture is that the, the finite orbits are, are, are risky dense. Okay, just like in the case, um, just like in the case uh, where where uh, uh, where, where um, R is one, so the case we already saw. Um, okay, so so what did what did Aino, Kurtz, and Buderwing actually conjecture? So so what they actually conjectured is that if you have any algebraic variety, the representations of its fundamental group, so also known as local systems, which are of geometric origin, so meaning they show up in the cohomology of a family of varieties, like what we saw on the very first slide. So they conjectured that those are Zariski dense. But if you apply that that conjecture to a, a generic Riemann surface, so generic point of the moduli space, it immediately implies this. So so this is the consequence I'm going to study. But, uh, um, Daniel, may, may I ask, mm -hmm. a kind of, uh, for me as an outsider, as a naive uh, uh, looking, the conjectures seems to contradict each other to me. Rather that, that, than that's right. You're, you're one step ahead. That's actually the next line. Because of the Jordan uh, lemma, no? Exactly right. Yeah. So, so these conjectures contradict each other if R is positive, is bigger than one. Oh, so so it's yeah. so I see. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. So these conjectures cannot both be true. Um, that that's that's sort of the point of the talk. So so in fact, one of them is true and one of them is false. Um, and I'm going to tell you which one, which one oh. is true, which one is false. Um, does that actually does anyone have a guess? Uh... It's it's all right if not. No, I'll think, tell you. I think I think the first one is more likely to be true. Yeah. yeah. So 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 the what I, what I'm going to tell you about is that the the first conjecture is true and the second conjecture is false. Um, maybe let me. I, I that said, I, I think the second conjecture is kind of like an inspiring conjecture, and and some version of it should be true. So I, like I'm working on something right now with Botong Wing where we try to salvage part of it. Um, 
the uh, the a big motivation for them is that some version over finite fields is actually true. So, um, so there is some there was like quite a bit of evidence for the second conjecture, even if even though it's false. Okay, so so let me tell you uh, the the main theorem. Uh, so this is all joint work with Aaron Landsman. So we have this action, the mapping class group uh, pi one of the moduli space acts on the the set of representations up to conjugacy. And the theorem is that if G is big compared to R, so G bigger than R squared minus one. By the way, it's not a coincidence that this is the dimension of of uh, of SLR. Um, then uh, then if you have a representation like this, whose conjugacy class has finite orbit, then it has finite image. Okay. So so this is uh, this is a, an effective version of this conjecture of Kissin and Wang. Um, so so Kissin just said that there's uh, Kissin and Wang just said if G is big compared to R and this is an explicit thing, uh, then this is true. We proved it, and it implies as 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 uh, as Alex observed that that this conjecture of Aino Kurtz and Buter Wang is false. Um, so so strictly speaking, what we showed is that a consequence of their conjecture is false. But if a consequence of the conjecture is false, then the conjecture is false. Okay. Uh, so that's what we've proved, uh, and and the proof is involved. So I'll say a little bit about it at the end of the talk. But it it, inv it involves on it, it relies on a lot of things. So it relies on the work of Machizuki and Simpson on non-abelian Hodge theory, uh, and input from the Langlands program through through recent work of Aino Groening. Um, so so let me just say a word about it. Maybe I want to stress like the the statement itself is actually like a it's like an elementary linear algebra statement you could explain to a explain to a, a high school student or like well maybe maybe an undergraduate. Uh, they, maybe it depends on 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 which which country your high school students are in. Um, so so what is one of these things? It's like a a, a bunch of matrices satisfying one relation. If n is positive, it's even just a bunch of matrices. Like like pi one is a free group. Um, you act on those matrices via some explicit transformations. Like you can write down this action totally explicitly, and you want to know if the n tuple of matrices has finite orbit up to conjugacy. Does it generate a finite subgroup of GLR? So it's just like an explicit linear algebra problem. So, so let me just say, like, I, I would really like a, a sort of high school or undergraduate level proof. I think somehow the the statement, you know, of course, I'm very happy to have found a proof, but uh, the statement doesn't deserve like uh, doesn't deserve all the technology we 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 were forced to throw at it. Um, okay. Uh, so so I, at the end of the talk, I'm going to say something about where the proof comes from, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this problem um, beyond what I've already told you. So, so like in some sense, this action and its finite orbits have been studied since the beginning of the 20th century. So, so I want to in in some other contexts. So not not the context of like Aino and Kurtz and Buter Wang and Kissin and 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 Junho Peter Wang. Um, but uh, and so I, I want to give you some of the history and, and tell you something about what people knew about it, even in in like the 1910s or 1920s. Uh, before I do that, are there, are there any questions about the main result? Okay, um, so so let me give you some history, and I also want to just give you some examples of of finite orbits. So I, I told you before that not all finite orbits have finite image. Like you need this big G condition, and so I'm going to give you a bunch of examples and and show you that somehow these finite orbits in general are are connected to really beautiful uh, mathematics. Okay, so uh, here's something horrible uh, or or beautiful depending on your preferences. Uh, so this is the case of the genus zero n mark four mark points and and rank two. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, where we look at, at SL2 representations, not, not GL2. Uh, so what is this? This is the Penlevé 6 equation. Uh, it's some um, uh, nonlinear second order ODE. Um, and it has the, the following kind of amazing property, which is that finite orbits of uh, pi 1 of the, of, of the moduli space, so, so mod 0, 4, on SL2C representations of, of this group, so, so maybe let me just remark that this is just F3. This is actually F2. The pi, pi one of M of M04 is M04 is P1 minus three points. So, so its fundamental group is free on, on two generators. Uh, sorry, this isn't a seven, it's a three. Uh, there's some explicit action. Um, and, and there these things correspond in a slightly complicated way to algebraic solutions to this differential equation. And I'll say where that comes from uh, in a little bit. Um, so, so this correspondence is a little uh, complicated. So, what's actually true is that there's some kind of equivalence relation here, which corresponds to. So, so there's a map from from the bottom to the top, um, and that map is surjective and and sort of explicit. 
but it, it does collapse some sorry this map from the top to the bottom sorry uh but it collapses some things but but the, the equivalence relation is also completely explicit so it's not uh, more or less you can this is this is a, almost an isomorphism you you can think uh okay so uh right so I just told you uh we have some some differential equation which was written down by Ricard Fuchs in 1905 and its algebraic solutions correspond to to this thing we've been interested in in a very special case so what's known about the algebraic solutions or in other words what's known about these finite orbits in, in that case um great so so here's the statement there's some correspondence like this um and uh so I I'm not a his mathematical historian most of what I, I learned about what well, most of what I know about this I learned from Philip Bolch um so so uh, I I'll try to give some overview but but any mistakes are, are mine not his um so so uh yeah so in some sense the classification of these algebraic solutions goes back to Schwartz and Poincaré who wrote down the first ones maybe let me remark so so they were working before 1905 when the equation was written down so what does it mean it means that from their work one can construct some algebraic solutions um so Schwartz for example was writing down uh all the hypergeometric uh equations uh with with finite monodromy so, so he listed that and then from those you can construct algebraic solutions to this panel of a6 equation um so so people were writing this writing down algebraic solutions discovering them I think this the subject was kind of revitalized by Hitchin in 1995 who discovered some new and kind of interesting algebraic solutions uh and then after that I, I don't know what order I put these in so there were algebraic solutions found by Andreev, Bolch, Kitaev, Hitchin, Duran, and Dubrovin, Motsako uh, Dubrovin Motsako uh, gave a partial classification, so they, they classified finite orbits with some assumptions on 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 the representation. So, so not for every representation. And then in, in 2014, Lisovi and Tiki completed the classification. So in this case, there's a complete classification of finite orbits here, or equivalently, algebraic solutions to Penlevé six. Um, the nature of their classification was it was computer aided. And what they actually showed is that the the pre-existing uh, solutions, so so the things that people other people had discovered already, were a complete list. Um, so they didn't discover new solutions. Uh, so so this computer aided classification has the following nature: uh, there's four continuous infinite families of solutions, one infinite discrete family, which is my favorite one, and and forty five exceptional families. Okay. And already, actually, we we can see here that that this condition that the g is large, g is large, is necessary. So so in these examples, there's many many finite orbits, uh, many finite orbits here corresponding to representations with infinite image. Um, so so for example, in 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 here, there's examples uh, with image uh, the two three seven triangle group. Uh, and here there are examples um, where, well, okay, so a representation like this is given by four matrices, um, and there are examples where the four matrices uh, are conjugate to one, one, zero, one, three times, and then the fourth one is conjugate to minus one, one, zero, minus one. Okay, so so it's not this represent like if you just took this representation or these four matrices, they don't multiply to one, so this is an actual representation. But I'm saying there's a representation where the four generators of this are conjugate to these four matrices in such a way that they, they multiply to one. And you can see that this can't have finite image because these matrices themselves have infinite order. Okay. Uh, in fact, this representation is semi-simple, uh, the, the one the, the, the ones in this infinite discrete family. They're, they're really beautiful. Um, uh, ultimately, they, they come actually from Hitchens' solution via an operation called middle convolution, which I'll, I'll mention later. Um, are there any questions about this classification? Okay, what about the next case? So, so I, I gave you some example of a braid group acting on matrices. So, so that's that was this case where G is zero and and we've n marked points and we're looking at arbitrary rank representations. So, so we're in this setting and we had the braid group acting on n tuples of matrices which multiply to one. Uh, there's a there's a the, the way one studies this is actually this data gives one a a ordinary differential equation. Um, so, so the fancy way to write that is that you have a, a vector bundle on on P one and a connection on it, which looks like this. So, so this is this is I think what people call a, a Fuchsian differential equation. Um, this condition, so these A i are matrices, these lambda i are points in P one. So this differential equation has poles at the lambda i, and this condition that the sum of the matrices is zero is just 
is just uh, saying that, that th there's no pole of infinity. Okay, so for each way of choosing a complex structure, I, I can get a, a differential equation like this. And, and what Schlesinger asked himself in, in 1912 is, well, if I, if I change the complex structure, how should I change these matrices AI while, while fixing this representation, while fixing the monitor me? Um, and, and he wrote down this, this uh, nonlinear ODE, which, which, um, which, classifies, which, which, which classifies the solutions. Uh, so if you want to move the lambda I while, while, while fixing the, the monodromy of this flat vector bundle, or like the monodromy of the solutions to this differential equation, this is how the AI have to change. They have to solve this differential equation. The, that horrible panel of A6 equation we saw earlier, you can, you can reduce this to that equation when n is four and r is two. Okay, so that's some kind of little, little exercise. Well, I shouldn't say it's a little exercise, but it's, a, it's an exercise. Um, the, it's also very fun to work this out. I, mean, I somehow with, with modern technique, it's, it's not that hard to, to discover this differential equation from the story I've told you. Um, th this one is much easier to, to kind of figure out than the panel base six one. Um, okay, so so here uh, we have this we have this uh, this I guess system of of uh, ordinary differential equations, and, and you could ask, uh, well, what are the algebraic solutions? And just like before, the algebraic solutions correspond to, to finite orbits of this action. Um, okay, so so, uh, so 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 why is that? Well, what does it mean that there's an algebraic solution? It means that you have a, a solution to this differential equation, which is finitely branched, right? But, but what, it, what, is, what does that mean? It means as you move these lambdas in a circle, you only get finitely many, uh, finitely many representations here, or finitely many differential equations. And that's exactly this finite orbit condition. Okay, so, so morally, that's, that's the reason why there's a correspondence between these two things. Uh, but in this case, we, we know almost nothing about the classification. So there's lots and lots of algebraic solutions. No, and I'll give you some examples soon. But like outside of this case, when like n is four and r is two, I think there's basically no work done when r is not two. There's a little bit of work done when n is five. And then n is six is like, it seems like a wide open question. Okay. Um, so, okay, so here are some examples of, of finite orbits just in general. I wanna tell you kind of what we know. Um, are there any questions before I before I dive into this? Okay, so, so let me remind you, we're back in the setting of a pure linear algebra question. Uh, you can interpret it as something in terms of differential equations. And I guess I explained how to do that when G is zero. Uh, when, when G is positive, you can also do it. You can't really write down explicit formulas, but there's a lot of work done by Critchever and other people. But let's just go back to this, this pure linear algebra question. So these this data is you know a, a 2G plus N tuple of matrices uh, up to conjugacy. Uh, and it's acted on in some explicit way by by a group you can write down the presentation of, and what are the finite orbits? Uh, so, so I think the the first really major work done on this in this generality is due to cats. So, um, so this space is an algebraic variety, and these rigid local systems. What does it mean to be rigid? It means you're an isolated point so, uh, of of this variety of um, um, from pi one into GLRC mod GLR. Okay, well, if you have an isolated point of this variety, uh, what, what happens when you, when you, well, what happens to the, what's the action of mod GN on, on, on the set of isolated points? Well, it has to permute them. There's only finitely many isolated points. So, so these isolated points give you finite orbits. Um, and these were completely classified by cats. Uh, in some in some sense, so so Katz has this beautiful book uh, from the '80s where he shows that that all these rigid local systems, so rigid meaning an isolated point. Another way of saying that is that they're determined by the conjugacy classes of the matrices around the punctures. Um, so you can make all of them starting from rank one ones, and then applying some kind of uh, slightly inexplicit operation. So so the main one is called the middle convolution, which is computable but but involved to compute. Um, I say this only works in genus zero. Of course, if you had a rigid local system in, in higher genus, the same argument would tell you it's a, a finite orbit, but, but it's, a, it's not so hard to see that the only rigid local, there are no rigid local systems except in genus zero. Okay. Uh, there's another uh, kind of obvious example. So this is the one we've, we've been talking about a lot. If you have a representation with finite image, then it has finite orbit. Well, why is that? You know, you can't, 
you can't move it to a representation which does which has a different image. So. All right, so the, there's a geometric source of um, of these finite orbits, and the main one is that if you take any local system on CGN, so remember this was the universal curve over MGN, so we have CGN to MGN. Well, if you restrict this to a fiber, it gives you a representation of pi one of the fiber, which is this thing. And it's it's kind of a little exercise to see that it has this finite orbit property. I mean, in fact, it's it's a fixed point. It's it's much more than finite orbit. And that's just because I mean this action kind of comes from thinking about the short exact sequence in pi ones associated to to this this space. Okay, so so I can make examples by making local systems on the universal curve, locally constant sheaves, or representations of pi one of the universal curve, if you'd like. Uh, and where do those come from? Uh, so in genus zero, there are a lot of examples. So, so I told you in, that Katz had this middle convolution operator, and Kostov observed that that if you apply this to any local system with finite monodromy, then you'll get a finite orbit. Um, and and why is that? Well, maybe let me before I say why. I mean, this middle convolution is kind of a complicated operation. In particular, it can send things with finite monodromy to things which don't have finite monodromy. So you produce lots of interesting examples this way. And the reason why this is is just that the, whatever this middle convolution op operation is, it's it's equivariant for the action of this group. So if you take something with finite monodromy, in particular finite orbit, then it will still have finite orbit. Okay, uh, there's another source of, of local systems on the space, which is topological quantum field theory. I won't say anything about that, but basically whatever TQFT is, the definition of it is that it, it produces for you for each GNN, at least in some if you've been extended TQFT. Of the appropriate dimension, a, a local system on this space. So, so for for the experts, maybe if you've heard of conformal blocks, that's an that's an example. And one can produce these these uh, finite finite orbits with conformal blocks. Um, okay, well, what's the most obvious way to to produce a, a local system on CGN? Well, we saw at the beginning, like the the best way to produce a local system is if you have a smooth proper map. You take the cohomology of the fibers. So here, if we have a smooth proper map X. Or X mapping in a smooth proper way to CGN, we can take its cohomology and get a get an interesting local system on this on this space. Okay, so so how are we going to make such a X? Well, well, there's a, a famous way to do so called the Kadira partition trick. I and mean, there's lots of other things you can do too, but this is just an example. Well, what you do is you take X to be a family of curves over the universal curve. And how do you do that? Well, what is a point here? A point here is just a curve with an extra marked point, right? So, so the fiber of this over here, this over a point here is a curve. And so uh, a, a point on that curve is, well, it's that curve and a point. And I'm gonna take X to be the family consisting of covers of C ramified at this point. And you can take like S3 covers of C ramified at that point. Okay, and so if, as you move the point around, the cover is gonna, gonna move. So you'll get an honestly interesting family of, of, of an honestly interesting uh, family of curves over CGN. And if you take the cohomology of that family, it'll give you a local system on CGN, and the restriction to a fiber will have will have finite monotropy. Okay, uh, let me just say, uh, I mean, I, I hope I've convinced you that these are all kind of interesting things, and, and my feeling is... Yeah, uh, sorry. Small, small question. Uh, you said uh, one point X, where does the... What do you... Aren't there N uh, marks? Yeah, so there's N punctures, and here X is a point other than the puncture. So, so I'm saying a point of this is a punctured curve and a point on that curve. So in other words, MG, CGN is MGN plus one. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. And this map is you forget the last point. Does that, does that make sense, Florian? Yes, thank you. Great. Yeah, so, so I hope I've convinced you. I mean, somehow the, the, the representations which don't have finite image are all related to really interesting math. I and mean, this is some kind of general pattern that I, I, I think it seems to hold. I'll, I'll make some conjectures in general soon. Um, Okay, so so uh, let me give you a conjectural picture. So this is kind of what I know or from from experience, but and what I think is true in general. But I don't, I you know, I can't prove it. So so the theorem I told you about says that in this regime where the the rank of your representation is less than is small compared to the genus, so r is less than the square root of the genus plus one, every finite orbit has finite image. Okay, I didn't tell you this, but but in the regime where r is polynomial in C, I know how to construct lots of examples. Uh, where a, a finite orbits with virtually solvable image. So uh, I, if you'd like, I can tell you after the talk where those come from. And then finally, in this regime where the rank is exponential in the genus, there seems to be like a huge zoo 
of, of lots of really interesting representations. So like all the ones I've shown you on that previous slide seem to fall in this regime. Um, okay, so so there's a reasonable conjecture here, which I think is that um, that that one should be able to really improve this bound if, if for example, one requires that the representation be semi-simple, but I, I don't know how to prove that. By the way, this zoo tells us that that really you you need this this condition that R is big compared to G to, to prove to prove anything. Okay, uh, so so let me make a a, a conjecture uh, a conjecture about the picture in general. So so the con the the con my my conjecture and and I I can check this in many cases, uh, and I I consider this to be some analog of super rigidity for the mapping class group, is that when G is big, G is at least three, all irreducible local systems on this space are rigid. Okay, and, and let me just say why that's interesting. So if you, so Simpson has a conjecture about rigid local systems and algebraic varieties, namely they all come from geometry. Um, and, and so if you believe this conjecture, it would imply that all the finite orbits come from geometric origin, are of geometric origin, meaning they kind of, they have this kind of explanation. They come from a family of varieties over, over CGN. Okay. So I, I think that's interesting. Uh, some I, I don't have a lot of evidence for this conjecture. I, I can give some evidence at the end if you'd like. But let me just say like where it comes from is that like ultimately the proof of the main theorem relies on proving some weak form of this conjecture. So so we show that in in low rank essentially this is true um, if n is positive. Um, so I'll 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 come back to that. Okay, so uh, I have I have 15 minutes left, uh, which is enough to say something about where the proof comes from. Uh, but before I do that, maybe I should pause for questions. Uh, Daniel, can you tell me again when when you said um, under a semi-simplicity hypothesis, the the uh, in that graph that you had, you extend it's the it's the lower one that you extend. What? Oh, oh uh, this is a, just a conjecture. Uh -huh. So, so the conjecture is that if you have a finite orbit, which um, which corresponds to a semi-simple representation, that then you can really improve this bound a lot. To to what? Uh, something exponential in in the genus, uh -huh. system, I guess. But okay. that's just a conjecture. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, so this without that, this bound cannot really be improved very much. So, so what I know is that in the regime where like R is um, two G, I think actually R equals two G plus one. Um, so, it, along this line, that there exists finite orbits with infinite image. So, so this theorem maybe you can improve it a little bit, but but not not beyond linear. Um, so, so. Um, yeah, that but, but yeah, so the conjecture is that maybe if if you like put out things which come from geometry are always semi-symbol. So so if you put on that condition, my, my guess is that you can really improve this. But it's it's just like I've looked at examples and all the examples of families in increasing G seem to grow exponentially in, in the rank. Hmm. But but that's that's the only reason I believe this. Um okay. Great. Uh so so let me say something about the proof. Um well, oh, maybe I should say. Are, are there any other questions before I do that? Okay, so so I told you the proof would would kind of come from some rigidity. Uh, I, I want to say a little bit about the strategy and remind you what the theorem is, and then I'll I'll say where that comes from. So so here's the theorem. So it says that if the genus of our curve is is big compared to the rank, um, then then um, that then, then the representation uh, any representation with finite orbit under the mapping class group is finite image. Uh, so maybe well, let me remark. Uh, it's actually, I think, kind of interesting that n doesn't show up in the in the theorem. So so the bound is independent of n. My guess is that if you increase n and and assume that the the monotremy of the punctures is non-trivial, probably the bound should in, improve. And we have some partial work in that direction, which maybe I'll talk about at the end if I have time. Okay. So so how are we going to prove this? Um. So so there's a the the main the main content is that we can understand this sort of linear algebra question of finite orbits in a geometric way, and for simplicity, I'm just going to assume that rho is irreducible. It, there there's not really a lot of new ideas handling the non-irreducible case, but um, there's, there's a few. Um, so what does it mean that this finite orbit that this orbit here is finite? It means that we're in some geometric situation. So what it means is that you can find a family of curves over some base which dominates the moduli space. And a local system on the total space of that family, so that when you restrict to a fiber, it has monodromy given by the representation you started with. So, so in other words, before I told you that if you have a, a local system on the universal curve, it kind of gives you a, a finite orbit. And this is kind of a partial converse to that. 
that says that if you have a finite orbit, you can actually make it into a local system, maybe not on the universal curve, but on some family of curves. Which And that family contains kind of the generic curve. Okay, and so this is kind of the key algebra geometric starting point. Um, and this lets us, you know, lets us apply the tools of algebraic geometry to this question. This is not a very hard, th this statement is not very hard. It's, it's sort of unwinding, unwinding definitions. Okay, so we're in this geometric situation now. We have a, we have a finite orbit and we use that to create a local system on, the fam on a family of curves. So we want to do two things. So how are we going to show a representation has finite image? First of all, we want to show this local system is actually defined not over the complex numbers, but over the ring of integers of a number field. Okay, so, so there's some arithmetic coming in, and, and we'll have to use some arithmetic input to get this. And then the second thing we need is that for all embeddings of that number field into, into the complex numbers, the associated complex representation is unitary. Okay, sorry. These two things together are going to imply finite image. Well, why is that? It's because the unitary group is compact. So here, OK is discrete, and the unitary group is compact. So if you have, what, what this tells us is that the image of the representation is a discrete compact set, and such a set is always finite. OK, so, so we're going to prove finiteness by proving these two things. So this is a arithmetic input, and this is actually kind of complex analytic input. So, so you, uh, if you'd like, you can think of this as saying that that V is bounded in the piadic topology for all P, and this is saying it's bounded in the Archimedean topology for all for all real embeddings. So yeah, that, that's kind of where this comes from. OK, so, so how are we going to prove this? Uh, so we're in this geometric setting. We want to prove uh, we're defined over a ring of integers of a number field, and we're unitary. And I'm going to start actually just by assuming that, that my original representation is unitary, and then we'll reduce to this case. OK, uh, so so then, OK, here, this part is hard. Um, one does some period map computation. So in the unitary setting, one has access to Hodge theory. And Hodge theory lets com us compute things like the cohomology of unitary local systems in an infinitesimal way. And what that computation tells us in this case is that, that, that this local system V is cohomologically rigid. What that means is that it, if you look at it as a, a point of the, the variety of representations of pi 1 of C, it's a reduced isolated point. Okay, so it's not just a not just an isolated point like we saw with when I talked about Katz's rigid local system. It actually is reduced. What this tells us by work of Eno Groening, which which ultimately relies on Lefort's work on the Langlands program over function fields, is that V is defined over OK. So this is the main arithmetic input. So already, if you have a cohomologically rigid local system on any smooth uh, quasi-projective variety. With some well, with some extra condition that we also verify, but I won't say anything about. So quasi unipotent monitor meet infinity, then it's automatically defined over the ring of integers of a number field. So this is some really beautiful work of of Eno and uh, So so we know it's uh, we know it's defined over k. Now we just need unitarity. Well, we already have unitary that that row is unitary, but 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 that actually isn't enough. So so what we actually need that is that row is unitary for all embeddings of OK into C. And this just gives us unitarity for, for the embedding we started with. So we need to handle those other embeddings. But what do we know? We know that this local system is rigid, and that's an algebraic property. So what that means is that for all embeddings of OK into C, the, the associated local system, complex local system, is still rigid. And then non-abelian Hodge theory, so work of Simpson and Montezuki, tells us that, that rigid local systems underlie complex variations of Hodge structure. So whatever that is, it's some generalization of being unitary that allows us to apply Hodge theory to study it. OK, and, and these CVHS have a very special property. Um, and, and I'm not going to explain this, so this is just for the experts in the audience. Uh, a CVHS comes with a vector bundle on a curve. And if that vector bundle is semi-stable, the CVHS is guaranteed to be unitary. And so what we show is that if you pick a point, point down here, you can perturb it a little bit to arrange that the associated vector bundle is actually semi-stable. Um, and this uh, this implies that the that the the local system is unitary. Okay, so so these are the hard parts, which I won't say anything about. I, I have some slides at the end I can I can use to show them show you more details if you have questions. But let, let me just move on for now. Um, so so okay, so in this case where we start with something unitary, we we win. So integral and unitary implies finite image. So so I want to explain how to drop this assumption now, but uh, or how to reduce to it. But before, let me just remark. Um, 
So, so this this question about perturbing M to make this vector bundle semi-stable was actually a, a question of Biswas He and Herdebees, and uh, there's some interesting history. Uh, so, so there are claims in the literature that for any flat vector bundle on any curve, you can always perturb. The, uh, let's say with irreducible monotropy, you can always perturb the complex structure to make to make the bundle semi-stable, and and we found a counterexample to that that statement. Um, so it's just false. Um, so, so this yeah, there were, this was claimed in like maybe four or five papers. Um, which we, we were, you know, were searching through last year to try to understand how they could be true after we found the counter example. So actually proving this, it, it really requires some, some extra work. It's, it's something that we had to correct some, some mistakes in the literature to, to prove it. So, so, uh, it was, there was this question of Biswas and her bees that they, they claimed the answer that it was claimed the answer is always yes. And it's, it's not, but it, it turns out in our situation, uh, it is. Okay. So, okay. So now, um, let's let's drop I want to explain how to drop this assumption that Rho is unitary so now we just have some semi-simple local system uh let's say V on a family of curves I, I don't want to assume it's unitary and I want to explain why why it necessarily has finite monotromy when you restrict to a fiber so why these these finite orbits why these finite orbits correspond to things with finite monotromy just in the semi-simple case okay well well whatever this V is non-abelian Hodge theory, so again, this theory of Simpson and Machizuki, tells us we can deform it to a, a complex variation of Hodge structure. So that's uh, a situation where we can use uh, the techniques of algebraic geometry to study it. Uh, we can use Hodge theory. Again, we can we can move our curve to make this uh, semi-stable, which means that this V prime, this thing we deform to, is unitary. So this V prime looks like the previous situation we were in. Again, a period map computation implies that this V prime has some rigidity. Okay, now what has happened? We've deformed something V to a rigid thing. So how is that possible? It means they have to be the same. Okay, so, so what this actually tells us is that, that this V is equal to the V prime that we deformed to. So, so what does it tell us? It tells us this row is actually unitary. So we're back in the situation from the last slide. And again, there's two pieces of kind of new content here that aren't just applying like fancy technology that other people developed. There's this perturbation to make a vector bundle semi-stable and this period map computation. And both of those are, are pretty involved. Uh, and maybe I'll just say a word. So I explained how to handle the case when row is semi-simple. Uh, the non-semi-simple case is, is related to a kind of uh, well-known open conjecture and topology, it turns out. Um, so, so I told you earlier about those Kodaira Parshan families. Um, and it turns out that the non-semi-simple case is, is related to understanding the monodromy of those Kodaira Parshan representations. Um, there's a conjecture that in general, they have big image in some sense. And we don't know how to prove that conjecture. That's like a major open question in low-dimensional topology. But these Hodge theoretic techniques tell us it's true in, a, in large G. So we, we kind of have, we found a, a kind of asymptotic version of this conjecture is true. And that's enough to prove the statement. All right, uh, so I'm I'm just about done here. Let me just summarize the proof and leave you with a question. Uh, so so how did it work? Well, we we had this kind of elementary linear algebra question about a, a group action on on n tuples of matrices. Uh, we translated it into a question about about local systems on moduli spaces. So so that lets us use the tools of algebraic geometry. We we, we found some kind of hidden rigidity in the situation. So the, those local systems turned out to be rigid. Um, and that that let us use rigidity to get an integral variation of hot structure. So integral, and then uh, we we got ourselves into this complex variation of hot structure situation, and, and used that uh, all together to prove unitarity and hence finiteness. Okay, are there any questions about the the proof before I I leave you with some questions? Sorry, Daniel. Which part of the proof uh, needs uh, the lower bound on the genus? Uh... That's a good question. So it's all these highlighted parts. Um, so 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 the the period map computation and this perturbation needed. Yeah. So somehow the 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 fact um, the what I, I alluded to this sort of previous claim that so this was always true. So it's not always true, but it's always true in low rank. So that's that's what we show. And then this period map computation it, it comes up in another way. Thanks. Kumar, did, did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Let, let me just leave you with a couple questions. Okay. So, so kind of for me, this there's kind of this motivating question, which I, I alluded to uh, earlier. So if you have an algebraic variety, you can ask which local systems on it are of geometric origin. So, so meaning show up in the, the cohomology of a family of varieties over it. And this is what motivated these original conjectures, conjectures of Aino, Kurtz, and Buter and Wang. They 
they can we're essentially conjecturing that there are a lot of local systems of geometric origin and this result proves that's actually not true Daniel, just one quick question about uh, this term geometric origin. So here uh, it's supposed to be smooth and uh, proper, especially proper. So uh... that that's right. Yeah. So so you the actual definition is you've x to s and then a u and s. Wait, maybe I have it on the slide. Sorry. Oh no, I don't have it on the slide. You have a u and s, and then you have a local system uh, v on s, and, and you want you want v restricted to u. To appear as a subquotient of ri i star of x. So smoothness is not a real condition because you're always allowed to shrink. Yeah. Properness is it's it's sort of a real condition, but not really, because you you only really study this for semi-simple local systems. And so you can always kind of find find them inside of proper things. So if my fi if the fibers are not uh, projective, would it still uh... it, it's basically the same thing. I mean, yeah. you you take an irreducible sub and then you can do some compactification and still find it. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah, it's uh, I, I said smooth and proper, but that's just to guarantee that that these push forwards are actually local systems. It's you you can you can if you have any local system which comes from geometry in an interesting way, you can always find it in one of these families. Got it. Thank you. But yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so so this question I, I think is really interesting. So it's like some kind of non-abelian analog of the Hodder take conjecture or something. Uh, the arithmetic version is the Fontaine Maser conjecture, but it's way too hard. And and the reason why is that like. It really depends on the complex structure. So if you take a curve, for example, and you, you take a local system on it, you can perturb the complex structure. So even if your first original local system was geometric of geometric origin, the, the perturbation typically won't be. So, so to have a hope of answering this, you, you need a kind of a topological variant. Uh, and, and so that's that's what, what this question is. So, so it's the question of which local systems uh, on, on the surface are of geometric origin for all complex structures on this space. And it's it's sort of sort of uh, so so this is sort of the most naive way of getting a question that only relies on topology. You just want it to be true for all complex structures, and it's a little exercise that such local systems necessarily have finite orbit under this mapping class group. So this finite orbit question is kind of an approximation to this to this really hard classification problem. Okay, but I, I made the super rigidity conjecture, and, and the the conjecture implies that sorry, there should be the word irreducible here. If you believe this conjecture, it's it's basically the same, at least if you believe some other standard conjectures, is the statement that these finite orbits are exactly the, the representations of geometric origin when G is big. So, so I think in my view, this is like there's a classification question here you could ask, just classify all finite orbits. So it would be like the biggest possible generalization of this classification of algebraic solutions to Penlope base six. I think writing down a list is probably impossible, but this structural fact, like like, do they all come from algebraic geometry? At least if the genus is big, is a plausible classification, and maybe uh, I'll leave you with that. 